text on Outdoor Journal. They're like little prizes. <laughs> you got it. Look at we that. spend a perfect spring day in Vermont, scouring the woods for morel mushrooms in the morning, then casting flies go. to native brook trout in the afternoon. We also visit the Bird Mountain Wildlife Management Area and explore some of the unique features of this wild destination. Then we spend a hot summer night shocking the waters of Lake St. Catherine as part of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department's Bass Research Program. This program has been made possible by a generous grant from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, conserving our fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all Vermonters to enjoy. There we go. Nice shot. For many outdoorsmen, spring in Vermont is like Christmas morning for a kid. You anticipate it for months, and when it finally arrives, you want to jump right in with both feet. And there's a lot to enjoy. From wild turkeys to wild edibles, the spring woods have much to offer, and the fishing is the best of the year. For at least one Vermonter, a perfect spring day is spent hunting for morel mushrooms in the morning and casting the native brook trout in the afternoon. It was a real treat when my good friend Leighton Wass invited me to share with him a perfect spring day, which for Leighton is spent both in the woods and on the water. Now I'm a retired biology teacher. I uh, taught at uh, Twinfield Union School for 33 years. Morel's uh, probably one of the most unusual finds in the woods. I guess that's one of the attractions to me. Not a lot of people look for them. Not a lot of people find them. And so it's something special. It's, it's different, it's unique. It's part of the uh, hunter-gatherer instinct, no question about it. These are pretty woods. They are beautiful. Particularly in the spring. Ferns add so much to it in my mind. Yeah. Now, you, you start basically by looking for ash trees? Certainly do. Yeah, there's one right over here. Yeah, there's a couple up ahead of us. Yeah. Morels are one of the most delicious and prized wild edibles in Vermont. Leighton has learned that they are most often found near ash trees. Other morel hunters like to focus on areas with old apple trees or elms. Anything that can narrow down the search area is helpful when hunting for morels. They come up in May, they're a spring mushroom, and as you well know, that's a fantastic time to be out in the woods doing most anything. And I've been doing this for about 10 years regularly now, and I wouldn't miss a morale season. Uh, matter of fact, I think once I came out on crutches looking for morels. According to Leighton, there are three common species of morels in Vermont. The black morels are the first to appear in early May. A week later, the white or yellow morels pop up for roughly two weeks in mid-May. They're followed by the giant or Bigfoot morels. We didn't have to walk far before finding our first morels of the day. These are the giants or the Bigfoots? They, they, they tell you that the season's pretty well winding down? That's correct. Once the temperatures reach upper 70s, 80s, Merrill season is uh, going to see the end, right. and these are the very last ones that, that make it. And as I recall, I mean, one of the ways of identifying morels once you pick them or cut them, it's, it's all hollow. The, the stem's hollow, the cap's hollow. Correct. Yeah, the, the two easiest ways to tell them apart from false morels is that fact that they are completely hollow inside. That makes them awfully good for stuffing. Right. And... <laughs> Uh, the cap is continuously attached to the stem. Uh, there's, the stem does not go up into, into the, cap the cap at all. The so-called false morels are easily identified by a white, pithy material inside the stem. Also, the cap is attached to the very top of the stem and looks like a skirt. 
I like to cut it just above the soil so that you keep them as clean as possible. That is a beauty. And you can see the, it's like a tube. So yeah. it's, it's hollow, no pithy base. Completely hollow. Completely hollow, caps hollow. And that very clear transition from stalk to cap. All right. Let's put that in the bag. We will. And I will take this fellow. All right, there's a start. There's a start. Here's one. Ah, uh, yes. Not quite as big yep. or as beautiful no. as those first two. No, it looks like it's There's been... another. So two, and of course be careful about stepping on one. Right. Eat, right? <laughs> when you find one morel, it pays to do a thorough scan of the area before moving on. Morels are often found in clusters, so when you stumble on one, you may have found an area that will produce a delicious meal for years to come. The first morels I found uh, here, I was turkey hunting. And it was purely by accident. I wasn't looking for morels, and that was 10 or 11 years ago. And now I can do both in these woods, which uh, is certainly a, a big plus. They're like little prizes. Uh, you got it. This is the prize of the, the woods, no question about it. It's that gathering instinct, Lawrence, you know, that, like you said, uh, we, we've got it in our genes. And some of it has, of us have it a little bit more and, than others, but I just love this. Yeah, and it's organic, it's sustainable, and hey, we're getting a little exercise out here also. Calorie free, calorie not free. a single calorie. Taste is just uh, salivating and a few nutrients. And one more thing I love about morels, Leighton, is they go great with wild game and fish. Oh, I mean, they're, yes. they're the perfect accompaniment and just wild edibles with wild game, I love it. Morcella esculanta, that white yellow morel, even those giants, you just can't beat them for flavor, in my opinion, and a few others, I think. And it's a delicacy that very few restaurants uh, supply. Whoa, I got one, Lawrence. As tasty as these delicacies of the woods might be, there are three cautionary things to remember. If you ever want to pick a mushroom, whether it be a morel or another kind, always first have somebody with knowledge identify it before you try eating it. Secondly, and this goes for all edible mushrooms, one should never eat a large number of wild mushrooms at one sitting, especially the first sitting. The other thing to remember about morels specifically is they should not be eaten raw. They should always be cooked at least five minutes. Oh, there's a beauty. Look at that, Leighton. Oh boy, that is as nice as they get. Yeah. Oh, slug beat us, but he's just on the. Oh yeah. Side. Yeah. Perfect specimen though. Yeah. Morels are a great mushroom for a beginning mycologist to uh, start with. They're so easy to identify, and they are so fantastic in the kitchen. You can't go wrong. All right. Look at that guy. That is one beautiful specimen right here. What a great, that's great morel. That's, that's the, the best one of the day. All right. Well, we'll give you more to carry. It's all right. We've got a nice little bag going as it is. We do. Put it right in there. I'm almost ready to go trail fishing. <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, that's, a, that's a nice bag. A couple trout. Well, those morels, I think, uh, make a super day. It would make a super day. After a few hours in the woods, we were happy with the results of our morel hunt and ready to move on to Seon Lodge State Park in Groton for lunch and some brook trout fishing. Seon Lodge State Park is a unique place in Vermont because it's the only state park that offers accommodations in an inn where we serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it's also situated on Vermont's only fly fishing only trout pond that's publicly accessible in the state. Seon Lodge is a renovated eight bedroom farmhouse that was purchased by the state in 1967. 
Its cozy accommodations display the rich history of outdoor traditions that its guests have enjoyed over the years. Tucked away in the lush woods and mountains of Groton State Forest, it's a great way to take advantage of all that Vermont State Park System has to offer without having to pack your camping gear. Here at the Lodge, there's so many different activities that you can participate in. There's bird watching, canoeing, there's swimming nearby in the Groton State Forest, hiking trails galore. You can um, watch for wildlife. You can relax in a Adirondack chair and you could just go outside and look at the stars even and a lot of folks of all different interests can enjoy all of these things. There we go. For Leighton and other anglers, the main attraction lies beneath the surface of the clean, cool water and noise pond. Part of Seon Lodge State Park, the fly fishing only pond was reclaimed decades ago by the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, and today it holds a healthy population of native brook trout. What a beautiful fish. The native brook trout, wild, gorgeous, some of those red spots. Wild as they blue come. Blue halos, as you say, no, no clip fins on these fish. You're not they gonna find a clip fin in there. Red. Brook trout are the most popular fish in Vermont. Good populations of native brookies can be found across the state thanks to management practices that protect trout habitat. The chance to catch wild brookies in a quiet, unspoiled setting has made Leighton a regular visitor to Noise Pond in particular. In 2009, Vermont's Forest and Parks Department presented him with a plaque commemorating his 200th trip to the pond. During his many visits, Leighton has caught, photographed, and mostly released a lot of beautiful fish. I think uh, 1987 was my very first year and I have fished it every year since. What keeps you coming back? Oh, Lawrence, look around you. Yeah, it is pretty. Listen, smell, uh, it's, the, it's the silence, the swishing of fly lines, and um, the brookies. Yeah. Their beauty is unsurpassed in my mind, and. I've been fishing for them since I was knee high to a grasshopper, and I don't think that's ever going to change. They're chunky here, they're feisty, they're fighters, they have tremendous food supply in this little pond, and they're all wild trout now. And so the fact that they're wild, they're native, they're born here, means a lot to me as, uh, as a fisherman. There we go. If you hit it right, the fishing on Noise Pond can be fantastic. Catching more than 20 trout in only a few hours is not uncommon. All fishing must be done from the park's rowboats, which are available for a reasonable fee. The boats are usually ready and waiting, although it doesn't hurt to reserve one during peak spring weekends. We had the pond to ourselves when we arrived, but as the day wore on, it became dotted with other anglers. Oh, that's a good fish, right? That feels pretty decent. All right, I'm getting my line in. That better be a good fish, because he's feels... putting a big bend in your rod. Yeah, he's taking a couple I can't of... see him. A couple of good light. Definitely bigger than anything I've felt yet today. But not giant, that's not a monster. decent one. He's plump. Nice and fat. Yeah, it's a healthy fish. Pretty close to the best of the day. I think you had one about like that earlier. I love it when your fly comes out in the net. Between 11 and 12. Nice fish though. Yeah, that's a beautiful brook trout. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's a wild fish. That's a beautiful brook trout. Aren't they pretty though? Yeah, I like that. You can't beat them, Lawrence. Leighton is one of my favorite hunting and fishing companions because whatever he does, he does it with enthusiasm. Whether he's picking morel mushrooms or catching native brook trout, his passion is infectious. A spring day spent outdoors with Leighton is indeed a perfect day. I love to fly fish ponds, and when I can find a pond that has brook trout in it, I'm in heaven. It uh, warms my soul every time I'm here.
Bird Mountain Wildlife Management Area is uh, just about a square mile, around 640 acres. Probably, oh, I don't know, six miles or so out of the city of Rutland, but once you get back in there in, in Bird Mountain, um, it sure seems like you're a long ways from, uh, long ways from town. Bird Mountain WMA straddles the towns of Castleton, Ira, and Poulton. It gets its name from the prominent 2,200-foot outcrop on the northeastern edge of the property, locally known as Bird's Eye Mountain. It was purchased in 1976, shortly after the banning of DDT, a chemical pesticide that led to the demise of Vermont's peregrine falcon population. We had a visionary working in the department named Jim Stewart, and Jim recognized that that was uh, historically used by peregrine falcons. and. Uh, Jim was before his time and, and uh, that piece of land came up for sale and uh, he recognized it as a very significant nesting site for peregrine falcons historically and once again now it's in state ownership and there have been peregrine falcons nesting there now for gosh a couple decades I think. Very consistent uh, producers, very successful uh, pair that keeps rearing and fledging young peregrines off that site. Bird Mountain WMA lies at the northern end of the Taconic Mountain Range. It consists of a mix of old fields, softwoods, and managed hardwoods. A recent acquisition expanded the area to 770 acres. Common wildlife species include deer, wild turkeys, gray squirrels, rabbits, rough grouse and woodcock, along with numerous songbirds. In terms of habitat diversity, we have former abandoned farmland primarily and there are still vestiges of, of some of the ag fields that were there which we are actively trying to manage to keep in that herbaceous uh, component because of, of the high value to a wide range of species that are using that. Uh, so we'll conduct periodic control burns in those habitats. We've also had a fairly aggressive forest management plan that is on a good bunch of that acreage dedicated to, to fairly intensive grouse management. So it means fairly frequent cutting periodically, specifically to try to get that early um, successional component of, of birch and uh, aspen that the grouse really respond to. White pines and other softwoods provide critical deer wintering habitat. The WMA is drained by small streams that feed in the gully brook which eventually flows into the Castleton River. Bird Mountain also has several trails, and it is a welcoming place to explore for both hunters and wildlife watchers. It's really a very unique place in terms of being, you know, relatively close to Rutland, but offers the, the perspective and the, and the solitude once you get in the forest of, uh, of a place that's really tucked away. It's really quite special in that regard. Okay, hit it. Joel, back here, right there on the bottom. Every summer since 1990, State fisheries biologists have conducted bass population surveys on lakes and ponds across Vermont. That one was work. On a hot and humid July evening, we joined fisheries biologist Sean Good and technicians Joel Flewelling and John Kimball as they surveyed Lake St. Catherine. Nice fish. Located in the towns of Pulteney and Wells, the 852-acre lake shoreline is dotted with cottages, and it's a popular summer playground for both vacationers and locals. Like many Vermont lakes, it's also gained a deserved reputation for its excellent bass fishing. To keep tabs on this resource, fisheries managers electrofish the lake at night. What electrofishing is, is basically catching fish with electricity. When the pulse is on, the fish's muscles are forced to contract. It's a, you know, it's a reaction to the electrical charge in the water. And when the pulse is off, the fish's muscles react. And that on, off, on, off ha happens 60 pulses per second. And what it does is it forces the fish to involuntarily swim towards the, the field of electricity. So wherever they're hiding, underneath a boat dock, under a sunken log, in a weed bed down on the bottom, 
we cruise along really slow at night with this boat with the cables in the water and those fish are drawn towards the front of the boat involuntarily they can't help it that was a good grab fish drawn into the electrical current are netted and placed in the boat's live well there they are soon swimming and full of spunk almost as if nothing happened a benefit of electrofishing surveys is that fish can be quickly collected and safely return to the lake, none the worse for the experience. Measuring them on the board is one thing. <laughs> Trying to get them to sit still on the scale is another. 462. So that's uh, just about 18 inches. Are these all smallmouth? The bass are first separated by species, either smallmouth or largemouth. Regardless of size, each fish is carefully measured and weighed. This information is then recorded so the data can be compared to surveys done over the past 20 years. The data that we gather it doesn't give us an actual estimate of, of the numbers of bass in a lake, but what it does is it, it's an indication or an indices of the quality of the bass that reside in, in whatever lake that you're looking at. And by quality, I mean relative numbers of bass within certain size ranges or groups within the population. Typically what we would expect to see is a, a good number of young bass in the small size range, 6, 8, 10, approaching that legal length limit. And then from 10 to say 14 or 15 inches, we really start to see that bell curve show up in the population where the numbers of bass in that size range really climb. So there's a lot of fish, you know, that are 10, 12, 14 inches. Those are your you know, your new recruits into the fishery that, that will then get to four or five pounds that anglers want to try to catch. Like many Vermont lakes, Lake St. Catharines shoreline is cluttered with docks, boats, and swim platforms. Navigating around all these obstacles can be a real challenge in the dark, but there is a purpose behind the madness. There's three reasons why we do this at night. One is the safety factor. I mean, we're putting a lot of volts and amps of electricity in the water and most people are asleep in their homes right. and so you don't have kids swimming off the ends of their docks and dogs in the water and, and things like that so it's just safer for us to be out here at night when people aren't around. Um, the second reason is efficiency basically. Bass are nocturnal foragers. They, they forage you know just starting at dark and, and through the night. And um, in the daytime, they tend to be out deeper, and so they're less uh, susceptible to the electricity. A third reason for shocking at night is it's easier to see the fish without the glare of the sun. A variety of factors can negatively impact the bass population. Everything from habitat changes to the number of bass fishing tournaments held on a particular lake. The annual surveys help biologists both monitor and better understand how these and other factors impact the bass fishery. We use this information to basically monitor this, the status of, of bass fishing uh, for anglers around the state. Uh, bass is becoming a, a very, very sought after species in Vermont. More and more people are recognizing the quality and the challenge of, of fishing for both smallmouth and largemouth bass and what great fisheries we have for those species in the state. And so by starting to gather the necessary data that we need on these populations as a, as a background, we can now start looking at whether you know, there's any potential changes that might affect the, the quality of fishing for these species throughout the state. Some anglers will fish a lifetime and never hook up with a five pound bass. But when electrofishing, a handful of lunkers always land in the live well. The growing popularity of bass fishing comes as no surprise to state biologists. In fact, the most recent Vermont Angler Survey only confirmed the importance of preserving this quality fishery for present and future generations. Since the time I could hold a rod with my dad and my grandfather out fishing as a kid, I've been interested and excited about catching fish and that you know carried on through school and it made me want to go to school and become a fisheries biologist. So when I'm out there and I'm doing my surveys, it just gets me ramped up that much more to, to turn around and say, oh, I gotta get out here and catch some of these fish this weekend that I'm seeing, you know. And it doesn't always work out that way. You know, seeing those fish in a survey doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna be able to go back and repeat it with a rod and a reel. Um, and sometimes that can be frustrating because I'll, I'll know that those fish are there and I can't catch them. It doesn't make me a better fisherman 
in any way, shape, or form, but it certainly keeps, you know, it keeps me interested in it. And it just makes me realize what an amazing fishery we have out there. And uh, I want to protect that as my job so that I can continue enjoying it as my preferred form of recreation and, you know, and keep that out there for everybody else that enjoys fishing. For more information on this or any other Outdoor Journal segment, be sure to visit our website at vpt.org. Our site features video on demand, contact information, and links to related sites. You can call, write, or email us. And as always, we look forward to your comments and suggestions. little prizes. Uh, you got it. <laughs> this program has been made possible by a generous grant from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, conserving our fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all Vermonters to enjoy.